Hello and welcome again to my physics online video lecture supplement series. Today's video is going to be a continuation of lecture set number 10 which covered the topics of rotational dynamics and specifically in this video I'm going to be looking at part 2 of that lecture set which is about the topics pertaining to angular momentum. So at this point in the lecture series uh, we have considered first of all the translational motion of any given object and we've considered kinematics, forces, Newton's laws, the energy and translational or, or linear momentum conservation laws and so on. And at this point what we're doing is we have from there looked at rotational motion and rotational dynamics and we've considered the kinematics of rotational motion we have considered the force analog which is torque we have considered the mass or inertia analog which is called the moment of inertia and we have considered the uh, analog to kinetic energy which is rotational kinetic energy and so at this point the only one of those topics that I've listed that we haven't really hit on is the rotational counterpart to momentum which is angular momentum and of course by not having discussed that we can't have discussed the associated conservation law which pertains to uh, angular momentum so angular momentum is conserved just like uh, linear momentum was conserved. So in order to get into all of that, let's first start by considering what angular momentum actually is. And the actual definition, or a simple definition for angular momentum, is that it is a vector. We use a, a letter L to represent the angular momentum. So lowercase p is linear momentum, L is angular momentum. And the definition for the angular momentum it is, is that it is the cross product between the vector r and the vector p. That is, it's the cross product of the vector pointing from your uh, sort of center or focal point of, of um, the rotational motion to the point at which the actual mass is located, uh, that vector crossed with the vector describing the momentum of that mass. And so some of the properties of this cross product um, are that the magnitude is always going to be given by the product of the two magnitudes of these vectors. So basically distance from your uh, rotational origin to the object times the uh, mass times the speed at which the object is moving. The, those latter two, mass times speed, gives you the magnitude of the actual mo momentum. And then there is additionally a second uh, or, or a third term, depending on whether you want to count p as two or one terms and that is the sine of phi term. The sine of phi is basically that this angular momentum vector uh, magnitude is going to depend not only on how big r and p are but also how well they line up or don't line up. So the larger that is this angle phi between the two the larger will be the magnitude of the cross product and that's true for angles of phi between 0 and 90 degrees. So the sine of phi is also factored into this cross product. Notice that that's sort of the opposite of what happens when figuring out the scalar value of a dot product. If we took r dot p we would have r times p times the cosine of phi. So the cross product differs in that we're using the sine of phi rather than cosine of phi. Another way that it differs is that whereas a dot product gave us a scalar, the cross product is giving us a vector. And that vector's direction must be perpendicular uh, 
to the directions of both vectors which were crossed to obtain it. So if vector r and vector p are here in the xy plane, then vector l, the angular momentum, must be parallel to the z-axis and therefore perpendicular to the xy plane. And before moving on, I should make note of two things. One is that I am using here a phi to represent the angle between r and p. And the other is that I'm using theta l to represent the actual uh, sort of angular direction of the momentum vector, the angular momentum vector that is. And so this theta l actually could be sort of two angles because r cross p must occur in some plane and l must therefore occur in a direction perpendicular to the plane. Really you need something like three dimensions in order to uh, deal with all of this. If, if you're only in two dimensions, or if, excuse me, if you're only in one dimension between r and p, then the cross product will yield zero. So these two have to be in separate directions, can't be parallel to each other. And the reason why I highlight that latter thing, sine of phi, being the angle between the two is because a lot of sources like to use a theta to represent that angle. Um, and so I'm, I have a slightly different notation than those other sources. And then this angle comma theta might actually represent two different angles, say one within the xy plane and one with respect to the xy plane. So of course if r and p are both entirely in the xy plane, then theta is going to be um, is, is going to have a 90 degree angle with respect to the xy plane for one of its components. So angular momentum is a conserved quantity. What this means is that if there is no net external force um, or torque acting on the system then the angular momentum and for that matter the linear momentum ends up being conserved. So if there's no external force, then linear momentum is conserved. If there's no uh, external torque, then the angular momentum is conserved. So the way that this is usually expressed is that if the sum of torques is zero, then the initial uh, momentum, angular momentum, and the final angular momentum are equal. Or conversely, what a torque is, is it is the change in angular momentum per unit time. Now you should be able to see here that there is some analog between these two expressions and Newton's first and second law of forces. Namely, if the sum of forces acting on an object is zero, then the object's momentum is conserved, and that means that the initial and final momentum are equal. And conversely, the sum of forces on an object is the change in momentum per unit time, which often gets simplified to ma. So in angular momentum, these are the two analogs to the first and second law of Newton's force. Um, another thing useful for us is the actual magnitude of this angular momentum vector. So previously I noted that the magnitude of the vector could be found by taking the product of the magnitudes of the momentum, the linear momentum, and the distance from the uh, sort of axes of rotation about which that momentum uh, is occurring. And then multiplying that by the sine of the angle between the two. Well, we can rewrite this expression by breaking up the linear momentum into mass times speed. And so we end up with r times mass times speed times sine of phi. And of course you can take the speed of an object and break it into the uh, angular speed times the radius at which this angular speed is operating at. So if you have a circular motion, for example, you might choose the center of the circle to be your axis of rotation, then V is equal to omega R. We found that in uh, basically in uh, 
rotational kinematics and in converting from translational motion uh, to rotational motion and back for rigid objects. So our expression now looks like omega r squared m sine phi. So angular speed times this radius squared times the mass times the sine of the angle between them. Well, r squared m times sine phi basically gives you the uh, moment of inertia or the rotational inertia of an object. And so, therefore, the magnitude of the angular momentum can be found by multiplying the moment of inertia times the angular speed. And among other things, what this means is since angular momentum is conserved in the absence of a net external torque, uh, that if you change the sort of radius of your object, then you must also change the speed at which the object is rotating. So down in this diagram, you have a figure skater whose arms and one leg are kind of sticking out a bit which gives us a, a relatively large radius for any mass in her arms and in her leg. And so she's spinning at some speed omega. And then she pulls the arms and the leg in. So that basically moves the masses in and therefore decreases the moment of inertia I because we've decreased the R squared terms for a bunch of mass. And so in order for angular momentum to be conserved, what that means is that her angular speed has to increase. So she may be spinning relatively slowly here and relatively quickly here. Another thing about the conservation of angular momentum is that we can basically rewrite it in terms of um, the initial conditions, in other words, her for the skater, the initial angular velocity times the initial uh, moment of inertia, plus the sum of all torques that act upon her is the final uh, moment of inertia times the final angular velocity. And so what this is basically saying is we're taking the previous case where she just pulled her arms and legs in and therefore sped up and adding in any accounts, uh, taking into account any effects from, say, uh, external torques. So perhaps there's some amount of friction between the ice and her skate. And since her skate is actually an extended object, therefore there may be an external torque that's being applied to her from that. Or maybe she's skating with a partner and the partner is attempting to apply a torque to one of her arms to help her spin up. Uh, and then she sort of pulls her arms in and therefore also increases her um, moment of inertia. And so the end result is that both of those things might uh, cause her angular speed to increase. I'd like to work a somewhat simple example of this last point before moving on. And so to do that, here we have a uh, block which is dropped onto a rotating disk. And the rotating disk has a known radius, a known initial speed or rotational speed, and a known moment of inertia. And the block similarly has a known center of mass moment of inertia and is dropped so that that center of mass rests on the edge of the disk or is equivalent to saying it rests 12 centimeters from the center of the disk. And the mass of the block is also given as 10 kilograms. And so what we want to know is what's the new rotational speed of this disk and block after the block has been dropped onto the disk. So to do that, we should start by making use of the things that are given in this uh, problem. Basically, we're going to be using the fact that the angular momentum is conserved, uh, or, or in other words, that the initial angular momentum plus uh, 
the net torque is equal to the final angular momentum. So we need to figure out all the moments of inertia that are at play here. And the uh, initial moment of inertia is given. Uh, it is in fact the moment of inertia of just the disk. So 0 0.250 kilogram meter squared. The final moment of inertia is going to be the moment of inertia of the disk plus the total moment of inertia for the block. So I've broken that into two parts. One is the center of mass moment of inertia for the block and the other is the moment of inertia which would be obtained by having a point mass placed at the same position as the block is placed uh, which has a total mass that is the same as the mass of the block. So that's what these two terms are. So the center of mass for the block uh, the center of mass moment of inertia was given as 0.0500 kilogram meter squared, but we need to determine what the moment of inertia for the equivalent point mass would have been. And the way we do that is we take the mass of the block and we multiply it by that distance squared from the center. And so that's 10 kilograms times 0.12 meters squared. Now the block uh, the the uh, distance was given as 12.0 centimeters, but remember that we want a number in kilogram meters squared. So that's why we're using 0 0.120 meters squared. The result of that is that you get for the equivalent point mass a moment of inertia of 0.144 kilogram meters squared. So if we want the final total moment of inertia, we have to add this number this number and this number together as per this equation. And so what we end up getting is uh, 0.444 kilogram meters squared as the final moment of inertia. So with that said, we can now do our conservation of momentum, which basically says that the initial angular momentum plus the net torque is equal to the final angular momentum. Now the net torque itself is actually zero because there was no torque applied to the disk or for that matter to the block in this entire problem. The block is just sort of dropped straight down onto the disk. So what that means is that the only parts that we have left are this initial and final angular momentum. So we can solve for the scalar value of the angular speed and what that is is that it will be the moment of inertia initially divided by the moment of inertia finally times the initial angular speed. So we can now plug numbers into that and what we end up getting is a final expression for the um, angular speed, a final number which is about 14.1 radians per second. So as expected the disk will be moving slower with the block added to it than it would have with no block added to it. Okay, so to summarize this, uh, we are conserving angular momentum and that happens as long as there's no net external torque. So if you apply a net external torque then you will get a change in the angular momentum but so long as the net external torque is equal to zero, then the change in angular momentum is also zero. That actually um, is analogous to Newton's first law in forces, but as applied to torques and angular momentum. Newton's second law, the analog, by the way, is that the sum of torques is equal to the change in angular momentum per unit time, and so long as you're not actually changing the moment of inertia in this process, what you end up with is the moment of inertia times the angular acceleration. So this is sort of like the mass term, this is sort of like the acceleration term in Newton's uh, second law, and this is analogous to the force term. So as applied to rotational motion, it's the sum of torques is the moment of inertia times the angular acceleration. So what happens if we apply a purely radial force to an object that is undergoing rotational motion? What would that do? For example, if you have a tether ball 
uh, which is tied to a pole. What happens uh, if you were to increase or decrease the force uh, of the string that is holding the ball uh, to the pole? Well, what basically happens is that the ball uh, has no net torque on it, so the angular momentum is unchanged. However, the radius of the ball uh, from the pole is changing. And that means that the moment of inertia I is changing and that implies that the angular speed omega will also change proportionally to compensate. So there was no net torque applied here. There is no change in angular momentum. However, the ball's speed increases or in some cases decreases if the if it's going the other way and the tension is lessening. Now notice that by changing the angular speed it's also possible that we have changed the linear momentum but that's okay because we had an external force that was applied to the ball to, to set this up to begin with. Uh, even if the analogy is extended to an object in circular orbit around a planet there is an external force that external force causes a centripetal acceleration that changes the direction of the linear momentum, although in this case not the magnitude. So now I want to look at a, a few little applications of angular momentum. And the first of these is the collision of extended bodies. So, so far we've had collisions. We've considered them from a standpoint of, of conservation of linear momentum and in some cases of energy. However, these collisions have all been treated as if they are collisions between two point objects. In real life you get collisions of two extended bodies. And so there's three possible conservation laws that can occur during these collisions. There's the energy conservation law, although Mechanical energy is the thing that's usually actually useful, and mechanical en energy is not necessarily conserved. In fact, it's very often not conserved in collisions. Any kind of inelastic collision will not conserve mechanical energy. The next conservation law is for, mo for linear momentum, and as long as there's no net external force on the system, the linear momentum will in fact be conserved. So. Uh, that's the law that we've used so far for most of our collisions. Finally, there's angular momentum. And as long as there's no net external torque on the system, then the angular momentum is also conserved. So we can use certainly these two and at times this one as well to determine what happens after a collision given the initial conditions or uh, if you'd rather, given the final conditions after the collision, what were the initial conditions before the collision? That latter one might be more useful for things like traffic court. The former may be a little more useful for things like actually designing roads uh, for safety or designing the safety features of a car. Um, the angular momentum is ultimately related to the rotational velocity by the equation L equals I omega, where these are both vector terms, L and omega. And what that means is that the angular momentum is going to be in the same direction as the angular velocity. I bring this up because it gives you in some ways a more easy or convenient way of determining the direction of angular momentum. Previously, I just said that it is the direction perpendicular to the r and p vectors, that is the radial and linear momentum vectors. And you can find from the cross product the direction of the angular momentum by using the right hand rule. However, it's sometimes easier to apply the right hand rule or to to figure out which direction this angular momentum is by visualizing the 
um, angular velocity vector. And that you can find by figuring out if this thing were constrained to move like a circle and what you have is a snapshot of the tangential uh, uh, speed which you can get, or tangential velocity, excuse me, which you can get from the linear momentum and of the radius, in which direction is that actually going to occur, clockwise or counterclockwise? And from the right-hand rule, what you can find is that a counterclockwise motion produces a positive z, or an upward-pointing angular momentum vector, whereas a clockwise motion would produce a negative z or downwards pointing angular momentum and angular velocity vector. And the way that you do that is that you use your right hand and you take your fingers and you curl them as if you are um, wrapping them around in the direction that the object is going to move via its angular velocity. So if it's moving more or less in the counterclockwise direction, your fingers should curl like they're moving counterclockwise. If it's moving in a clockward direction, you curl your fingers as if they are in a clockwise direction. And you tilt your hand accordingly uh, in order to make that happen. So by curling the fingers of your right hand counterclockwise, you find that your thumb points upward. And by curling them clockwise, you'll find that your thumb points downward. So with that said, the angular velocity gets changed by an angular acceleration, and that is basically caused by um, a torque, as we found before. And so therefore, the angular momentum is also changed by torque. So this is sort of a restatement of Newton's second law analog as applied to torques and angular momentum. It's worth noting that the torque is always perpendicular to the applied force. So the net torque is generally given by the cross product between the net force and the lever arm radius. We found that in a previous lecture set. And the therefore what that means is that the net torque has to be perpendicular both to force and to lever arm. And so if you apply a force in, uh, as shown in this diagram, say downward here and upward here, then the direction of the torque is actually towards you. And if you apply them in the opposite directions, upward here and downward here, the torque is away from you. And so what that means is that the change in angular momentum must be perpendicular to the direction of an applied force that's causing the torque. So the spinning bicycle wheel in this uh, picture, when there's a force applied here and here uh, to try and turn it upright, will actually resist being rotated directly upright. Instead, it'll kind of slide. So for example, uh, one of her hands will move towards her and the other will move away from her while she's trying to do this. It's going to twist perpendicular to the direction of the forces. So that actually kind of explains how a top works or how a, a gyroscope would work. And so this diagram here is showing a picture of basically a top, which is spinning along an axis that is not perpendicular to the ground. And so what that means is that the center of mass is not directly above the point that's in contact with the ground. So gravity pulls downward here and therefore applies a net torque to the stop, uh, to the uh, top. But that torque is applied such that um, the direction of the torque is essentially like this. Uh, it's not downward like this. So the actual result of this is that rather than having the top just tip over, the top continues to spin and then it precesses about this little cone. So because the torque is in this direction, that's also going to be the direction of the change in angular momentum. And so basically what that means is that the top of the top 
uh, you can sort of draw an angular momentum vector through it rather than pointing to here that vector will now point to here and then a little while later it'll point to here and then to here and here and so on and so it basically describes a sort of cone of motion and so it's not that the top stays upright it's that it also doesn't manage to fall down and so the change in angular momentum is not towards the ground which is what would need to happen for the top to actually fall over so I wanted to work through an example and uh, then I want to discuss the implications of this example a little bit. In this example what we have is a uh, basically circular disk with a given mass and a given initial speed and it hits into the end of basically a, a stick. And on this end of the stick there's a nail that secures the stick to the otherwise frictionless table and on this end maybe there's a piece of tape or glue or whatever so that the uh, disc upon hitting the stick sticks to it and so what happens is that the stick is free to rotate around this pivot point but it's not necessarily free to slide away from the pivot point and so we want to know what happens to the angular uh, momentum, what happens to the kinetic energy, what happens to the angular velocity for this pair of objects uh, after the collision. All right, well, the uh, basic concept that we're using here to solve this is that we have no net torque. So sum of torques on this system is zero, and that means that the initial and final angular momentums should be equal. However, the net external force on the system is not zero. The reason why it's not zero is because we have a nail on one end of the stick which is actually exerting an external force. So the internal force is any force exchanged between the stick and the disc. Um, but because this happens, the implication is that the initial and final linear momentum are not necessarily going to be equal. Furthermore, because the two have collided, there is going to be a non-zero change in energy in the system because the two have stuck together. In other words, we have a totally inelastic collision. So the actual principle that we can uh, make use of is this one right here. That's the one that we are mostly going to be using to solve this particular problem. So that means that we need to start off by figuring out what the initial and final angular momentums are. Well, the initial angular momentum should be I times omega. And in this case, what we have is essentially the uh, disk initial and we have the stick initial. And the stick is initially not moving, so this term is actually zero. And so what this means is that the initial angular momentum is entirely due to the disk. So what is the disk's initial angular momentum? Well, basically what we have to do is figure out what the uh, moment of inertia for this disk is, and we have to figure out what the angular speed for the disk is. The things that we're actually given are that the mass of the disk is 0 0.040 kilograms, and we're also told that the... Um, initial speed of the disk is basically going to be 25.0 meters per second. And so uh, the other thing that we're told that's not about the disk but kind of is, is that the uh, stick itself, if we were to draw a little diagram of the stick, sort of the before, 
is secured on one end by a nail and that this distance from end to nail is given by 1.25 meters. So in a sense this is sort of like the radius uh, about which this disc is moving because the disc hits this other end of the stick in the problem. So what we can use is basically I is equal to m r squared and then omega is equal to v over r. So if you put these two together you have I times omega is m r v. So for the uh, disk uh, basically what this gives us is um, that we need the mass of the disk which is this quantity, we need this radius which is this quantity, and we need the initial speed of the disk. So therefore we have 0 0.040 kilograms. We're multiplying that by this radius which is 1.25 meters. We're multiplying that by the uh, initial speed which was 25.0 meters per second. All right, so let's do that multiplication. And what I come up with is that this initial angular momentum is 1.25. And of course, the, uh, the units for that are going to end up being joule seconds. So the common unit for angular momentum is often joule seconds. Of course, you could also use uh, kilogram meters squared per second as an equivalent unit. All right, so we just found what the initial angular momentum is. That actually is one of the answers to the question given because we're supposed to find what is the angular momentum before and after. And uh, we use conservation of angular momentum. So this term that we just found is also should be equal to the final angular momentum. So I suppose that I maybe prematurely boxed that because this is part of the answer as well. All right, well, now that we have that piece of information, what can we do with it further? We're supposed to be finding the angular velocity of the system finally. Well, we can see that the final angular momentum is equal to the total uh, moment of inertia, so that's for the disk plus the moment of inertia for the stick uh, times their uh, joint angular uh, speed. So in other words it's the moment of inertia of the disk times the angular speed of the disk plus the moment of inertia for the stick times the angular speed of the stick, but since the two are stuck together, those two angular speeds are equal. So what that means is that I can solve for the final angular speed. It should be the angular momentum divided by the sum of the uh, two moments of inertia. So um, the moment of inertia for the stick we still have to determine. We already found it over here uh, for the um, disk. Basically you can plug numbers in here and get 1.25 meters squared times 0 0.040 kilograms and so what that gives you is um, a, a total angular uh, moment of inertia of 0 0.0625. So for the disk it was 0 0.0625 and of course the units are kilogram meters squared. So now we need to do for the stick. And the stick what we're going to do is basically treat it as if it's sort of a, a rod and so the moment of inertia for a rod is always given by, uh, which is fixed at one end, is given by one-third of the mass of the rod uh, 
times the length of the rod, which uh, that length is the same r that we have down here, uh, and of course that r is squared. So this becomes one third of uh, 2.00 kilograms, because that was what our mass of the stick was, times 1.25 meters squared. So uh, if you do all that, what you end up getting is uh, about 1.04. So if you round it off to three significant figures, this thing becomes, uh, or, or maybe to, to a few more significant figures, it's, it's 1.0416 repeating. So I'm going to round that to the three significant figures and call it 1.04. And again, kilogram meters squared. All right, so our final angular speed, therefore, must be this 1.25 uh, joule seconds divided by the sum of these two uh, moments of inertia. So 0 0.0625 plus 1.04 uh, kilogram meters squared. So if we do that, then what we end up getting is uh, a uh, total angular speed of approximately uh, 1.13 radians per second. So the final uh, angular speed is approximately 1.13 radians per second. And that actually is part of the answer to the question in this example, so we should uh, denote it as such. The last part was that we're supposed to be figuring out what the kinetic energy is uh, for this pair after the collision. And we can figure out what the kinetic energy before the collision is for whatever that's worth um, because the uh, initial kinetic energy, I'm going to use a, a capital K for that, is one half of the mass of the disk times the initial disk speed squared um, plus essentially one half of the moment of inertia times the angular speed of the stick squared. And of course this term is zero. So for the initial one we would have one half of the mass which is uh, 0 0.040 kilograms uh, times the speed squared which is 25 meters per second squared. So what you do, what, what you get when you put all of that together is that the uh, initial kinetic energy is actually about 12.5 joules. But that's actually not something that we need to answer this problem. I just wanted to put it there for um, comparison's sake. What we really want is what the final kinetic energy is. And to do that, we note that the two are stuck together. So once again, we have one half of the sum of these two moments of inertia. So uh, disk plus stick and that times the final angular speed squared. So this angular speed that we just found in the previous part has to be then multiplied by the um, total moment of inertia that we have found previously. And so what we end up getting here is uh, we have half times this 1.13, uh, number squared times the 0 0.0625 plus 1.04 uh, kilogram meters squared number. And what I end up getting for all that together is that the final kinetic energy for the system 0 0.706 uh, roughly joules. So that's after the collision. So you can see that quite a bit of energy is lost in this collision. Uh, 
Um, so energy obviously is not conserved here, which is what we would have expected when the two stick together. There are, of course, a variety of things that we could consider that would be make this sort of a different problem. Uh, for example, what if the stick uh, collides with, or the, the disc collides at the end of the stick and comes to a stop rather than adhering to it? Uh, what if the uh, stick bounces off in such a way that both angular momentum and kinetic energy are conserved. In other words, you have an elastic collision. Uh, what happens to the linear momentum before and after the collision? What if the disc hits the stick somewhere other than the edge? Or for that matter, what if the fixed end is somewhere other than the end of the stick? All these are things that we could in principle consider. The one that I think is most interesting to consider though is what happens if the disc does not hit uh, right here at the very end? What happens if it hits elsewhere on the stick? And the reason why I think that's interesting is because it illustrates a point which is that the location upon an object in which uh, a collision occurs matters very greatly as to what ends up happening and um, to the nail in all of this. Now you would find if you worked through with the numbers that I gave that the linear momentum is not conserved and that's because in this case there's a force that is applied by the nail. It turns out though that there is a particular point somewhere on the stick where the disc could have hit the stick and the end result would have been that there's no force applied by and therefore also no force applied to the nail. In other words, some particular location where the disc hits the stick uh, causes not only angular momentum to be conserved but also linear momentum to be conserved. And the result of that is that there's no force that needs to be uh, supplied externally, that is by the nail. And this uh, particular point is what's called a percussion point. And it's actually a very much of interest to those who are doing like sport science or exercise science, that kind of thing. Maybe to some extent physical th therapy. Um, which is that, for example, maybe you play tennis and you know that when you're swinging at the ball with your tennis racket, there's different points where the ball might hit the racket. You might hit the racket very much at the edge of the racket. You might hit it somewhere on the handle of the racket. Usually that means you're kind of a bad aim, but I guess that's better than not hitting it at all. Or you can hit it at a particular point, usually pretty near the middle of the racket part of the racket, the netted part of the racket. And if you hit it at that one point, you find that your hand doesn't really get jarred all that much by the impact. And the reason why is because at that particular point, you've hit a percussion point. And when you hit that percussion point, you are conserving angular momentum, you're conserving linear momentum for the system. And the result is that there is no external force that needs to be applied to the racket. And so what that means is that your hand, which is what would be applying this external force, does not need to apply any additional force to the racket other than what was already being applied to swing and to hold the racket. So therefore there's no jarring of the racket and no jarring hints of your hand. And so this is true. Um, for not only tennis rackets or discs and sticks, but for any kind of extended collision. Uh, for the sports folks, this means stuff like your baseball bat, uh, if you like fencing, then your swords, hockey, your hockey stick, golf, your golf club. All of these have a percussion point somewhere. And it should be added that these um, percussion point is not necessarily the same thing as the sweet spot, but the two tend to be 
kind of closely related. Uh, very often the percussion point and the sweet spot are sort of the same. Um, you can find these things experimentally, uh, I suppose reasonably easy. Basically you stand there holding the tennis racket like this diagram does and have somebody shoot a ball at it and hit it in different points and see which one jars your hand the least and that's probably your percussion point. In theory it's relatively difficult to actually find where the percussion point is. So that's it for this particular lecture. Um, hope that you enjoyed it. I didn't work as many examples this time around as I have in lectures past and that's just because I'm trying to uh, keep my lectures shorter um, than 50, 55 minutes, an hour, that kind of thing. So uh, hopefully the examples that I did work were the ones that you needed to see. Um, and I guess I, I hope that you found all of this actually helpful to you. And those of you who are in my course, well, we'll discuss it more in class. In the meantime, thanks for watching.